All right, next topic. Welcome to uh, software engineering once again. Today let's talk a bit about how the build process actually works. So what happens when you compile your, your code. And so for this we're going to look at how the path actually looks like that takes us from the source code to the executable binary. Um, in particular there's two important steps. One is the actual compilation and the other one are static and dynamic linking. And then we're going to have kind of a look under the hood of a uh, Hello World program, both for C code and for Java code. All right. First of all, um, let's look at how a source code actually is converted into something that can be executed. So um, there's two different parts to both of these uh, processes. One is what ha what's happening at compile time and one is what's happening at runtime. So when you have Java code, for example, then when you compile it with Java C, then it's, it's converted into a class file which contains so-called bytecode. And bytecode is something that will then be uh, executed by the Java virtual machine when you run it with the Java class name, for example. And at runtime, while the program is running, the Java virtual machine will then translate uh, the bytecode into machine code, and that is then actually executed on the process. On the other hand, if you compile something like C or C++, for example, then at compile time, this is first converted into assembler source, and that is then immediately uh, converted into machine code into also a binary file. But then when you start the program at runtime, that machine code is immediately executed directly on the processor. So there's, there's no intermediate step like with Java, where first the bytecode is translated by the virtual machine into machine code and then executed. If you have C or C++ uh, then, or uh, whatever other compiled language you're, you're looking at, then this is uh, at compile time converted already into machine code and that is then directly executed on the processor. Of course, um, there's one important uh, difference uh, visible here. So the machine code is always linked to a specific type of processor. So if you compile a C or C++ program, then the machine code, for example, will be only for Intel processors or AMD. Um, and for example, not for ARM. On the other hand, if you have uh, Java bytecode, then the translation into machine code happens at runtime. And so the Java virtual machine will always translate it into the right type of machine code for the specific processor you're running on. So um, you can execute the same bytecode on an ARM processor or on a uh, Intel processor. It, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, on the other hand, if you have a C++ file that's been compiled for Intel, then you do need an Intel or maybe AMD processor to execute it and can't use it on an ARM processor. You would have to compile it again for a different processor with a different set of machine codes um, if you also want to execute it there. So that's basically the big differences between Java, which is a, a language using a bytecode that's at runtime translated into machine code. And on the other hand, we have C++, which is at compile time translated into machine code and then can be executed directly. Of course, that often also means that C and C++ have a slight uh, performance advantage because they do not need that additional translation step at runtime. But that heavily depends on what specific uh, workload you're you're having, um, and sometimes Java isn't really noticeably slower in any way. Um, but for for occasional specific uh, application scenarios, C++ might be quite a bit faster. So that's this is the one big trade-off between these two um, approaches. All right, so let's have a look first of all what happens when you um, compile C. So let's see, say you have a really simple Hello World program and then you uh, run GCC, new C compiler on that and get a program output. There's four stages happening in there. First of all is the pre-processing step, then the actual compilation, then the assembly step, and last but not least, linking, which is actually split into two stages. So this is actually quite a complex process, and I've tried to illustrate this with a diagram here. 
So uh, we start off with the actual C or C++ source, and that is first of all run through the preprocessor. This is just basically uh, translating macros and loading include files and so on, and will basically produce as an intermediate step um, a pre-processed C file, which is still C code, with, with uh, a couple of modifications that, for example, all the include files have actually been copied into the code. Then comes the actual compilation, and that means that the C code is translated into assembler. You can actually look at these intermediate files uh, if you want to, and then they have the ending.s. Um, so this is assembler source, which is then processed by uh, another tool, which is actually called the assembler. And that then produces the actual binary object, the uh, which is already containing the machine code. And then several of these object files, uh, depending on how your program is structured, are taken by the uh, compile time linker, which is a program called LDD. And that will then actually produce the executable file. Um, and last but not least, when you actually uh, run that, then the runtime linker is invoked. That will, for example, take care of loading libraries that the executable needs and so on. And um, these are the, the two stages uh, that, that linking involves. So at, uh, uh, on, one, on the one hand, at compile time, all the uh, machine code objects that the assembler produced are combined together into one executable. And then additionally, when you actually run the program, the runtime linker will, for example, take uh, additional libraries that the program needs and also load them into memory. And so you can execute each of these stages basically manually by invoking the, the individual programs that uh, um, are responsible for each stage. However, you can also invoke them all together like in the uh, example previously. So all of these steps together can be uh, can be run internally by GCC. So you can just uh, put in a C source code and include files and get out an executable um, that you can then run uh, with the runtime linker. All right, so this is the process for uh, C and C++. For Java, it's a little simpler actually. So compilation and assembly are done in one uh, in one step basically and linking also uh, is just one step so there's no pre-processing and there's no separate assembly stage. Um, for Java we of course start out with our source code too and then run Java C, the compiler, which then produces the class files containing the bytecode. Um, optionally, we can also put those into an archive. There's a jar, uh, for example, the jar tool, which can pack all sorts of class files together into an archive, which is actually just a zip file. So this um, you can look into into a jar file with any uh, archive archive explorer tool because it's actually just a zip file with a different ending and the specific structure inside. And then both the jar files and the, the class files containing the bytecode can be loaded into the virtual machine and that would internally take care of uh, the, the actual translation to machine code. And if uh, your Java code requires any um, system libraries, then the Java virtual machine will also take care of loading these into memory. So. The process is a little bit simpler for Java. There are a lot less uh, sub-stages involved. Um, uh, but for example, internally, the compiler still uh, translates uh, everything into, into an intermediate representation and that is then converted into actual um, bytecode. And you can actually have a look at this intermediate representation too. I'll show you an example um, in a bit. All right, so what does the linker actually do? We already mentioned this in relation to, to the C, C and C++ compilation. The main task of the linker is to combine multiple objects into one binary. Um, and this has quite a number of advantages. First of all, you can um, you can modularize your code, so you can have uh, reuse um, the same code block several times, maybe even without having to recompile it. So if you have 
code that is redundant and can be used in several projects, then you can only produce one um, single object file and uh, link that into several binaries, for example, or you can produce a uh, actually a shared library that is then loaded by multiple binaries. There's different different versions to uh, to this modularization approach. Then um, what the linker also does is to basically uh, find suitable places in memory where to put the individual object files. So each object file uh, by default or each binary compilation unit only exists uh, on its own in the first place. And they would basically all overwrite each other if you just put them all into memory at the default address. So what the linker does is to actually arrange them properly so they don't overlap and they can refer to each other. This is also the important an important task the linker does. Many objects or basically almost all objects contain so-called symbolic references. So these are not memory addresses, but rather names. They can refer to uh, functions in libraries or also to functions in other objects. And um, once the linker has arranged everything in memory in a suitable way, then it will resolve these references to other objects, for example. This is, uh, happens both at compile time and at runtime. So at compile time, for example, the linker will already resolve um, references to other objects that are in the same compilation step. And at runtime, the runtime linker will then resolve references that uh, refer to library functions. So these three uh, tasks together are the main jobs that the, the linker performs. Okay, I already mentioned um, the memory layout. This is an important aspect to keep in mind. This is fairly technical, but it's still worth knowing about. Um, so first of all, let's have a look at how this works in C. Um, the layout is actually the same for each program. So each program has its own virtual memory space um, and the operating system takes care to actually put that in a suitable location in, uh, in, in physical memory. Um, the virtual memory will actually look the same for each program and it contains a four main uh, main parts. The first one is the text segment. This is where the actual machine code is located. And this is usually read only. So to make it more difficult that the program kind of gets overwritten accidentally or intentionally. Then we have the data segment, which contains all the global uh, variables. Um, and then we have one big empty space that's shared by the stack and the heap. Um, on the stack, we store everything related to, to local variables inside a method and also the return addresses. Uh, we'll come to that later when we talk about debugging in more detail. And whenever you create new objects with new or remove them with free, then this is uh, managed on the heap. And as you can see, they both share the same empty area and they both grow in different directions. So if you're uh, uh, careless with your memory allocation in C, then it might actually happen that the um, the stack grows too much so that it collides with the heap or the other way around. There's of course protection mechanisms against that, but uh, it will still cause your your program to to terminate. And um, so you have to take care to, for example, not let the heap grow too large. In C and C++, you actually need to remove any object that you uh, that you created with new. You need to remove that again uh, yourself with free when you're done using it. Otherwise, it will sim simply hang around forever on the heap and uh, start to, to clutter that. Um, with Java, it's a little different. So everything you see here is inside the Java virtual machine. We have one heap that's shared across all uh, threads. We have uh, several stacks. Each thread has its uh, own stack. Both of them have uh, a fixed maximum size. And of course, if you exceed that, then you get a, get a stack overflow exception, for example, because then the memory on the stack is, has been used up. And we have one more additional storage area for the methods. This is kind of like the text segment previously in C. The, 
uh, most central difference uh, regarding the memory layout between Java and C is that uh, in Java, the Java Virtual Machine has a so-called garbage collector, which takes care to um, to look for objects that are no longer referenced and then automatically deletes them. So that means, um, in theory, as long as you don't actually use up more memory than your, your heap has, uh, you should never have any memory leaks because the garbage collector will always collect uh, unused objects and remove them. Um, there are some scenarios, for example, if you have circular references, then it depends on what sort of garbage collector you're using, if it is able to actually uh, detect that and still remove the objects if they're unused. Um, one big issue here is, uh, or one potential issue at least, is that the uh, garbage collector actually, of course, also takes a bit of, of performance to do its job, to look through all the memory references. And so um, sometimes performance heavy Java programs can occasionally slow down uh, intermittently because the garbage collector is running and then it will take performance away from the main tasks. So um, if you have really problems with something like that, then it's uh, of course pos possible to manually tune the garbage collector and only have it run at specific times, for example, but this is uh, rather an advanced topic which doesn't occur quite as often. But if you're, if you're dealing with really performance intensive Java programs, then this is still something to keep in mind. All right. So I already mentioned that linking is performed both uh, in, in a static and in a dynamic fashion. So static linking is what happens at compile time and what then results in the, the actual executable. Um, the big advantage is, of course, when everything is linked together at compile time, then you can't have any incompatibilities because then the other, otherwise the linker would already catch that at compile time. The big drawback is if you only do static linking, then your program will become quite large because every function you're using from, from a system library or uh, anything like that will also have to be basically copied into your, uh, into your executable program. Um, on the other hand, dynamic linking is done at runtime and uh, the results from the dynamic uh, linker are then what's loaded into memory. And the big advantage, of course, is if you don't link everything uh, statically, for example, library functions, then the program is a lot smaller. Um, the drawback is that if you don't have the same version of library which the program was built against, and especially on Windows, this is still a, a widely known problem, which sometimes is described as DLL hell, um, then the library used to load the program into memory it has actually different functionalities, different memory addresses and so on, um, compared to the one that was present at compile time and then you get all sorts of weird incompatibilities and crashes and so on and so this is uh, something to, to keep in mind. So um, for these reasons for these reasons it's usually combined. Uh, both variants are, are used together. Everything that belongs to one program is uh, statically linked into one binary file and all libraries that that program is using are then linked in dynamically at runtime. Of course, that means that you have to take care to actually load the correct versions of each library. Um, both for C and for Java, there's a way to look at the, the static uh, linkage. So what other object is one binary you're referring to? And for uh, C++, you can also look at the dynamic linkage, meaning which libraries is that executable going to load. In Java, this is not something you can do immediately from the uh, command line, because this is done only at runtime uh, via the system library. Um, so you would actually have to examine the, the bytecode individually to find out if there are any, any external libraries being loaded. Um, all right, so much for linking. Now let's have a look under the hood, so to say. Um, so we're going to take apart a Hello World program, both in C and in uh, Java, and have a closer look at what's what's going on inside. 
Um, okay, first of all for C. Let's say we have a really simple Hello World program like this one. And then we uh, execute the very first compilation stage, which is the preprocessor. And that won't do a lot actually, except that it will replace this include directive with an actual copy of the uh, contents of that uh, include file. So uh, it will just yeah do exactly what the statement says. All of these uh, hash commands this are actually for the preprocessor so it will just uh, include a copy of that uh, of that file um, then next step is the assembly stage and we can actually look at that individually so when i now run this preprocessed c file through the actual compiler then i will get a uh, .s file containing assembler code, which will roughly look like this. And there's actually quite a, a number of interesting parts in there. So we have a uh, read-only data section, read-only data, which contains the uh, the fixed string we used in our uh, print um, statement. Then we have the text segment. If you remember previously, the text segment actually contains the function itself. And here's the definition for a global label, which is of type function, for example. And here's the actual label with the code for the function. And the green uh, bits are basically uh, more or less boilerplate setup and cleanup code. I won't go into too much detail here. Um, the important part is here the inner bit, which first of all loads a reference to this label up here, to the string that we want to print and then calls the printf function. So this is the um, the assembler code, which is kind of a still humanly readable um, version of machine code. And when we now run this through the actual assembler, then we end up with, um, with a dot .o with an object file, which contains the actual machine code already, but there are still some aspects that are not yet ready for uh, for actually running it. For example, the start address is uh, entirely zeros. That means it hasn't yet been run through the linker. And uh, the references in the code here are still zero. This is a reference that re refers to the, uh, the read-only data section containing the uh, string. And this is a reference containing, uh, referring to an external library containing the, the printf function. And last but not least, when we now run this object file through the linker, then to, uh, after the static linkage has happened, basically, we get the following layout. Now the start address, this is a random address uh, selected by the linker, has been filled in. And now these references are also um, um, actually containing data. So this is a reference now to the uh, to the data segment containing the str actual string. And this is a reference to a lookup table, which refers to the um, to the external library functions. So this is what's uh, what a program is going through basically when a, a C program is compiled until we actually arrive at the binary machine code. Now let's have a look at the same thing for Java. This is a, a, a little less complex at first glance. So uh, once again, let's say we have a, hello, a very simple Hello World class. And um, when we compile that into a class file, then we can afterwards actually take the class file apart again and look at the individual um, bytecode commands. And the program we have here actually consists of just four bytecode commands. So it's actually not a lot more, uh, a lot different from the assembler machine code we saw earlier. And three of these actually are, are important here. So the very first one will just fetch a static class, class field. Um, sorry, we'll just fetch a static class field. Basically, it will get the reference to print stream from Java lang system dot out. So system out print ln needs to first get the reference to that uh, to that static class object. And these hash numbers actually refer to a object pool. 
Um, so the, f the number two is referring to this field. Then next one, number three, um, is referring to a constant string in the object pool, which is also our message. And uh, last but not least, the method um, um, printLN is invoked on the object we fetched earlier. Um, the Java Virtual Machine is a stack machine, so we don't have any registers like with, with regular processors usually, but we um, first put this static object on the stack, then we put the, um, the parameter on the stack, and then we uh, invoke the method, which is taking these two previously uh, loaded parameters off the stack again. And last but not least, the uh, method is done and we return. So we have four uh, individual uh, bytecode commands. And of course, as you can see at the offsets, these are also actually quite small. So this one is uh, three bytes long, this one is two bytes long, this one is three bytes long. And so the actual uh, uh, binary representation is also quite small, just the names of the individual commands are a bit longer. All right, so much for um, the build process and the internals of, of C and Java programs. Uh, as usual, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to post a message on Moodle and see you for the next lecture.